Houndsman XP fans, we are back on schedule after a shakeup last week. Josh is back at it on the truth, and he's got Mr. John Brookman, who is a local historian in Missouri, and he is going to break down the rich history of coon hunting and how it shaped what we've got today in the coon hound world. If you like history, if you like stories, this episode is for you. Before we get to that interview, I've got to remind you that hound hunting is under attack all across the United States. The anti-hunting crowd is absolutely in full court press. And we are using this platform, our social media platform, every platform we have available to get houndsmen fired up to stand up for hunting freedom in the United States. I know that a large portion of our listeners on The Truth are coon hunters and coon hunters in the East competition, coon hunters, and maybe you think that this does not apply to you. Well, it does. Every time we can make the anti-hunting crowd use their money to fight us, we are making them bleed. Why is that important to the houndsman in the East, the the coon hunter in the East? Obviously, uh, coon hunting is not in risk or in peril at this time. However, it will come. But I want to open your eyes to another facet of this thing that maybe you haven't considered. The animal wackos know that it is going to be nearly impossible to outlaw the management and the taking of raccoons. Without a fur market, which they took from us, raccoons have become a nuisance animal on the landscape. Farmers hate them. Homeowners hate them. And there's a lot of support for management, for hunting, for us. So the anti-hunters know that that is an uphill battle. They cannot achieve that. So what are they going to do? We see it all across the United States right now. They're going to come up with animal welfare bills that restrict your opportunity and your freedoms to own a hound. They're going to restrict and put restrictions and regulations on how you house your hound, how long your hound can be outside, how long it can be unattended, whether it can be Uh, Roman at large the list goes on and on they're super creative they find ways to attack your freedom so I'm asking you if you are a houndsman if you're a coon hunter in the east Arizona Colorado and Vermont need your support and your voice as a houndsman you can check out our social media platforms we have got all the information you need blasted all over our social media platforms on Facebook at the Houndsman XP podcast group and the Houndsman XP podcast page. You can also check us out on Instagram at Houndsman underscore XP underscore podcast. We've got it all out there for you. It's in our stories. That's all we've been talking about. It's that big. It's that important. Your fellow hunters in the West need your help right now, and we can get this done together. Don't be intimidated. By the time you have listened to me blabber about this, you could have already fired out effective emails to the people that need to hear from you. So check it out. Hey, we've had Josh pinned up for a whole week. I know he's raring to go. I've got him collared up, and I'm getting ready to cut him loose. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Truth on the Houndsman XP Podcast Network. And today we are joined by a very special guest, that if you haven't heard of, you probably should have, <laughs> Mr. John W. Brookman. Now, I'm going to give a little uh, backstory on Johnny. I was raised coon hunting with John Brookman. My brother was raised coon hunting with John Brookman. And John Brookman has been a big part of our family for as long as I can remember since I was born i remember john being around now sometimes we'd lose him for a year or two <laughs> sometimes sometimes john would go in my a and eventually we'd look around and we'd say where's brookman at and then, but he'd show up and we'd go hunting again but uh john is a wealth of knowledge about the place where we're sitting right now uh ravana missouri which is a town of what i don't know how many people you think are in ravana johnny about 35 right now yeah about 35 people And at one time, that was, I mean, that was, John, how many coon hunters were in Ravana in the heyday? And I'm not talking about just guys with dogs, but I'm talking really good coon hunters. When I moved to Ravana 
in April of 73, there was about 70 people lived in Ravana, 50 of which hunted. Mm -hmm. And there was, like I said, you know, uh, there was probably 140 hounds in Ravana. Yeah, big time hounds, not just no. A lot of them were I good dogs. I mean, dogs that would. There was no junk dogs. People shot them. I mean, yeah. you're talking. It was a whole different mindset in those days. There were no big money hunts. Every little town around this country had a coon club, mm -hmm. and they were all UKC hunts, but they weren't big hunts. They just normal old. But, uh, huh. I mean, you could go to a UKC hunt every week or two weeks and never get an hour and a half from the house. How many dogs would be at them hunts? 30 to 40. Yeah. Now at the UKC hunt, local hunt, maybe 10 or 12 dogs, I'd say. Well, there was 30 or 40 at every hunt. And yeah. the ones people like to go to, you know, like Livonia, 60 to 80 dogs. Really? And that was back around 73, 74, somewhere around in there? Yeah. When did you get... How old are you now, Johnny? I'll be 63, March the 8th. You'll be 63, March the 8th. When did you get your start hunting? Who started you? My granddad lived out southeast of Ravana, where the Peach One sites are now. Yeah. We had hogs in a hog lot. The hogs run wild, just, you know, range hogs for in a... 40 to 60 acre lot which was timber and we fed them right out the back of the barn so you could tree a coon at the back of our barn I don't care what the weather was you know and uh, you know uh, this country is mostly white oak soil all the ridges were grass and timber the bottoms were farmed mm -hmm. uh, and there was always a lot of coon because there's always an abundance of feed but I got started coon hunting. We had a neighbor live south of us, two of them. Herschel Coker was one, Robert Gibson was the other. And they both had hounds. So. What kind of hounds they had? Um, Robert Gibson had Brandenburger bred plots. And Herschel just had some old mixed up black and tan blue tick crosses that he'd had for umpteen years were they good dogs yeah really i mean now they wasn't a dog like you know people think of a good dog today they think of a competition type dog the the mindset of people back then were different you know nobody give a shit about the competition hunts because you wasn't hunting for no money there wasn't nothing serious you was just going to go out there and have a good time and if you won you got a little trophy about 12 inches tall mm -hmm. you know so nobody nobody bred to win hunts they bred to put coon hides in the back of the truck you know yep. so your dogs hunted different you know dogs kind of stuck around you more didn't go as deep you walk well, yeah, did you walk I mean, hunt back then a lot of people walk hunt oh yeah yeah and uh they never really uh you know they wouldn't just hunt right you didn't have to just walk them Yep. But most of the dogs would make a big old circle, you know, about a quarter of a mile around you. And, you know, most people, if they didn't hit a track, they picked them up and went to the next draw or the mm -hmm. next creek because they'd done made a quarter mile circle. You know, there wasn't nothing moving too good. Yeah. But people bred back then, you know, nowadays in competition, you don't want a dog that's really mean, but you want a dog that will not be run off the tree. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Back then, if you had a dog that would fight at the tree, you hunted by yourself because nobody would hunt with you. Right. So they bred dogs to not have any aggression. And dogs usually treated together back then, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if people, if people went hunting together, they wanted their dogs to work together. Yeah. And so you look at now, most of our dogs are a little rough. Yeah. But... And they're, very independent. Yeah, but they're never with each other, so you don't want to usually have any trouble. You know, you'll have some trouble here and there with a dog that wants to be with another dog, and then you draw a dog like ours or something, you know. Now, but back then, they were always together. And you I, didn't want to walk. You didn't want dogs spread out two miles apart and have to walk all the way in between them all the time either then. No, because, see, 
90% of the people that hunted then hunted to catch coon. Mm -hmm. I started driving around hunting two years before I had a license. You know, I'd be in a pickup driving somewhere hunting. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. I bought a brand new 1979 Ford pickup in 1979. Custom paint, tinted glass. It was the fanciest truck they made at that time. Two-wheel drive. Is that the one you went to Colorado with, with Marty? Yeah, filled the, <laughs> filled the back up full of beer and hired him to drive. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do? You put a tarp in the back to filled hold it. Filled it full of ice. Filled it full of ice and beer. Well, I filled it full of beer and then went down there to Trenton to the ice place and had him fill her up with a chute. Just, <laughs> just like filling a auger wagon with corn. <laughs> and you guys went to Colorado? No, hell. We went to Colorado first, then we went down to New Mexico and over to Arizona <laughs> and back through Texas and Oklahoma and cut down into Mississippi. And we was gone seven days. <laughs> and just seeing the country. How long did it take you to run out of beer? Seven days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you bought that new truck. I wouldn't went... have made it home in seven days if I had any beer left. <laughs> So you bought that new truck, and then you went to hunting in it. Yeah. And did, did, how'd you pay for it? With coon eyes? No. I sold Missouri Realist Magazine door-to-door -door Yeah. to the Amish. Yeah. I paid for that truck in six months. Really? It cost $6,000 in 1979. That won't even pay the insurance on a truck in a year now. 1979? Coons was worth 35 40 bucks a pop. I have treed right here around Ravana, 24 in a night. Yeah. You know, and what I'm saying is $200, $250 in your pocket in a week was a hell of a job. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a real job. You could make a, you could make a hell of a lot more money skinning yeah. coons, and coons were thick. What, because uh, you were working, you, were you working construction then? Yeah. And so you'd take, because I know when I, early 80s, you know, Grandpa would take winters off. Uncle Timmy would take winters off. Uncle yeah, they'd have, an uncle, winters they'd have an uncle diet yeah. to start a coon season, <laughs> and the wake would last till the end of coon season. <laughs> but that's how they paid. You think of what Tim's trapping, trapping checks were back when he got really good. I mean, that was a big part of someone's income back then. And, and see, everybody that hunted done the same thing. Yeah. There were people that were dedicated to competition hunting, but most of them had a, enough money they didn't have to worry about nothing. Yeah. You know, and, you know, if you wanted to go to a PKC hunt back then, it was PCA, Professional yeah. Coon Hunters Association. You had to go at the very extreme southern border of Missouri. There was a few small hunts, but if you wanted a real money hunt, you went to Mississippi, mm -hmm. Alabama, southern Arkansas, you know. There was, were no money hunts. Was anybody from up here making that trip back then? No. Yeah, I didn't think there was. That's my dang phone. Well, I can't get mad. Usually Jed's the one that leaves his phone on during a podcast and I yell at him. I ain't got nobody to yell at but myself this time. Well, I want to hear it. <laughs> but <laughs> Now, we had people that were big in competition hunting. Everett Smith at Bethany yeah. had an English dog that was Platte Valley bred. He called Ringo, Bingo. He called him Bingo. And at that time, the world hunt, there was just one world hunt, the ACHA world hunt. Yeah. It was the biggest hunt in the United States, the most prestigious. Yeah. He was in the top five, five different times with that dog. Really? And he was real big in the English Association. Yeah. And he got a hold of a dog... I can't remember. It's been a lot of years. I'm thinking he was out of his female. The dog was out of was McCracken Stanny, and I can't remember the name of the dog he was out of, but he was out of the 1977 ACHA World Champion. And ACHA was it back then. I that, mean, that was, was it. The, that was the creme de la creme world hunt. Yeah. If you won the ACHA World Hunt, you had the baddest dog in America. That was yeah. the end of the story. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, this dog was called Diamond. And he was a walker dog, 
mostly white, little black spot around his tail, a red head. He was ticked up, and all of his pups were ticked up. Mm-hmm. Well, at that time, <coughs> the Walker guys were trying to breed for clean color. Yeah. So now the Walker guys wanted to breed to him. He was the first hard, wide, straight line hunter that I ever hunted with. So that wasn't that was rare back then. Rare. Nobody liked the dog. Yeah. But now, as far as striking ability, tracking ability, drifting a track like he was tied to something, and one bark tree dog has a meat, take all the pressure in the world, you could turn a bulldog loose on him. Didn't make no difference. He had all that. But they wouldn't breed to him because of looks. And the fact that he was a straight line right. hunter. And, he, and I'm talking now, if you turned him loose though, when the coons weren't moving, Charlie Berry handled for Smith. Mm-hmm. And we turned him loose one night, and he went three and a half sections before he got treed. So that's three and a half miles. Three and a half miles, and had a coon in a lone oak tree in the middle of a great big-ass cow pasture, but he had the coon. Yeah. But see, we had no garments then. There were no garments. That dog had a big mouth. But I'm going to tell you something. You hunt him, you stayed at the truck because you had to drive till you could hear that sucker. Yeah. You know. That was way before his time. Oh, yeah. He won Autumn Oaks when he was 10 years old. Really? Autumn Oaks was probably the top UKC hunt at that time. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was prestigious, even to the ACHA guys. I mean, you win Autumn Oaks, you had a coon dog. And he, he blasted through Autumn Oaks like it wasn't even there, 10 years old. And, and we're talking, I don't remember, but way long ago. You know, you could buy a good, solid, honest coon dog, 300 bucks. Yeah. I mean, one you could consistently tree coon with night after night. There's a 10-year-old dog, and I was at Everett's trying to trade for a little walker female there that was out of his spud dog. He had a walker stud, Big Creek spud. Mm -hmm. And those dogs was, you know, close hunting dogs, but they laid, that old dog threw a lot of dogs that could lay coons up, didn't even need a track. You know, so I was trying to get a hold of this dog. And Everett's a money guy. You know, he had he knew people all over the United States, big money, big dog guys. So, you know, he wasn't used to dealing with broke little farm kids. <laughs> but I'm sitting there working a deal on this dog, and a guy walked in Everett's house with $7,500 cash money. Yeah. My truck only cost $6,000. Uh, that's sixty, seventy thousand dollars today. And he laid it on the table and he says, I want the diamond dog. And Everett just raked it off the table with his hand and laughed. He says, You ain't got near enough money to buy that dog. <laughs> He's ten years old. Yeah. You know? And I can show you where he's buried. I don't know who owns that property now, but I can show you where he's buried on that property. And see, John, that's a dog. I've been around here hunting. When did I start hunting with you? 85? Yeah. I was five years old. Me and you and Grandpa started going and Jeremy. And I've never heard of that dog. Not once. Well, I guarantee you, if that son of a gun was alive today, we'd you'd all, have heard about him. We'd all <laughs> would he. That's why we got you on here, Johnny, because there's... When I was growing up, I remember Grandpa would want to go visit. You know, it'd be Sunday after church, and he'd say, let's go to visit him. And we'd always go to Ravana. And we lived at Mercer at the time, which had been eight miles away from Ravana. And we'd go to your house, we'd go to Lloyd's, we'd go to Kenny's. And that was the, that was the three visiting stops we'd make. Sometimes we'd stop at Randy's on the way out, and Grandpa loved talking coon dogs. Oh, yeah. So I remember... Uh, at that time, who, the West, Daryl. Was it Daryl? Yeah. Yeah, Daryl had some dogs then, too. Good but, ones. Yeah. At that time, there was just... Uh, Hampton wasn't in Ravana at that time. No. And so it was just Lloyd Wilson, Kenny Francis, and you that had dogs, and that's who we'd stop and talk to. But in the heyday, when Hampton was around and all them dogs were around, what, would, what are dogs that come just out of Ravana that could have won anywhere that were good? Because, I mean, these were good houndsmen. 
And the that, whole town was full. They could have won anywhere yeah. against anybody. Yeah. Darrell West had a black and tan dog called Sport. Lloyd Wilson had the Jake dog. Mm-hmm. Lloyd Wilson had the Zeke dog. This is when he moved here. He moved from South Missouri in 1973. Yeah. moved up here. I got to tell you this little story. Chuck Willis, good guy. He's not a coon hunter. Mm-hmm. Well, Lloyd's son, Steve, really didn't do a lot of hunting. But he'd went a lot with his dad, you know. Yeah. Now, this Zeke dog, he wasn't a hard wide goer or nothing, but he was like a vacuum sweeper. If he opened his mouth, load the gun, sharpen the knife, you're shooting a coon. You know, mm-hmm. he didn't jack with cold tracks. If he opened on the ground, he was going to tree it, and he was going to have it. And he could lay coons up. Well, Steve ain't no dummy. Him and Chuck got to talking. Steve, you know, being Steve, he's telling him, well, I think I'll go hunting tonight. It's like 12 degrees, wind's blowing 20 mile an hour. It's snowing. It's in January. It is miserable. Steve's telling him he's going to go coon hunting. Chuck goes, you're full of shit. You know, he goes, well, I'll go tree coons. Chuck goes, ain't no way. Steve goes, oh, yeah. Well, Steve's smart enough to know that, you know, when the coons are rutting, them old boars are laying up on them tree mm-hmm. limbs. That Zeke dug tree every one of them. We went down there to that farm I used to own, down there where PSF is now, on the creek. Big old oak timber, hollow trees, every big old maples, hollows. We turned loose. We treed three coons in 40 minutes. Chuck paid the bet. <laughs> We went home. <laughs> Last time I ever knew either one of them to go coon hunting. <laughs> you know, Lloyd, Lloyd was hunting tramp, I think, when I first come around. You remember that dog? Yeah. That was a pretty good dog, too, if I remember right. But yeah. I wasn't very old. Now, Lloyd Wilson's man gave me my first dip of chewing tobacco. We were, I was eight or nine years old, and uh, we were walking. Lloyd had that cage coon right there by the coon club where Lloyd lived because we had the coon hunts there at the community building. And then Lloyd had that cage coon. Now, back then, everybody would go tune their dogs up on that cage coon. Remember that? Grandpa Chuck thought that was a good idea. Looking back now, I don't know, that, that don't do no good. But <laughs> Yeah. Here, here's Missy, who was six years old and had treated a thousand coons, you know, and he's over there letting her bark at this cage coon to get her mind right before the hunt, you know. But, and she treated more coons in her sleep than most oh, yeah. dogs at that hunt yeah. tree. And, uh, but anyway, we was walking over to Lloyd's, and I was with Keith Beavers, who was my age. And he goes, hey, Lloyd, can I have a chip? And Lloyd always carried that Levi Garrett. And he held it out, and Keith took him a big old dip of her. I thought, well, I'm tough as Keith Beavers. I'll take me one, too. I said, Lloyd, can I have one? And he handed it to me, and I took it. Boy, it wasn't 10 minutes later, Lloyd was washing me, washing the puke off of me with a garden hose, just laughing. <laughs> he thought that was the funniest <laughs> thing ever. I didn't know Keith had been chewing for a year. He, he took to it a little better than I did. Oh, yeah. But Lloyd had Jake, too, right? Yes. And you had Jake. Did you have Jake? No. Okay. I had Jack. You had Jack. Now, Hampton had Jake two or three different times. Well, Hampton got Jake as a puppy. Mm-hmm. And I, he want had go, I want you to go through the whole story of Jake, because I never got to hunt with Jake. And as I was growing up, everybody bragged on that dog about how great that dog was. What was he like? I never got to hunt with him. He was... Capable of winning any hunt against anybody at any time, even today. He had an outstanding mouth. You could hear that thing three miles against a hurricane force wind. Hard, classy tree dog. Stand on the tree. Hard, wide hunter. First strike dog. Drifted track like he was tied to it, just bam, 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 treed. Cover ground like a racehorse. Really? Was he a big, good-looking dog? Was he oh, athletic? he was a beautiful dog. Really? He looked like a walker dog supposed to look like. And that thing threw Jack? Well, that was because of his mom. Oh, yeah. Babe. Right? I had a female out of that same litter. Jack's litter. Jack mm-hmm. was born in 1984. Okay? I had a female that looked like Jake. Beautiful. Run a tree of coon. Had Jake's mouth. 
I sold her when she was six months old for $800 because Jack was better. Really? And that guy was from Eastern Missouri. Roger Carl was his name. He's one of very few people in the world. He did a complete tour on a medevac helicopter in Vietnam. He done a complete tour as a door gunner on a on a gunship helicopter in Vietnam. And he's got three bullets against his spine, so he hunted on a four wheeler because sometimes his legs work and sometimes they don't. Yeah. He ended up with babes and her. And when they both of them, when they got old, they became house dogs. Yeah. And they ate steak every day. And that pup I sold him for $800, you couldn't have bought that dog with a brand new Escalade. I mean, really? there was no money. His ever- wife would run you off if you even asked a <laughs> pricer. His wife would run you off the property. Serious. I went and tried to buy her. She told me to get gone. Because <laughs> I heard so much about Jake. Now, I remember Jack. I remember that old ball mouth tree dog. And I remember if he was barking on the ground, it wasn't a coon. It's probably a coyote. He was the first dog I ever put in a competition hunt was Jack. I couldn't have been, but he was born in 84, and I think that would have been 89 was my first hunt. So he'd have been five years old then. But uh, everyone just kept saying, you know, Jake, 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 and how good Jake was. Now, how many times did Hampton, did Hampton buy and sell that dog multiple times? He raised him from a puppy, and he hunted him. And Lloyd kept after him. Mm-hmm. Well, Hampton got in a little bit of a financial difficulty, so he sold him to Lloyd for $1,000, which at that time was a pretty damn big chunk of money for a dog. Yeah. On the condition that if Hampton got back on his feet, he would sell him back to him for $1,000. Lloyd was not very happy when Hampton got back on his feet and showed up with his $1,000. I'll bet. He probably never thought it'd happen. He didn't think it would happen. I mean, I love Jim Hampton. He was a good man. Mm -hmm. But he was wild and crazy on a par that most people aren't even... Let's see, I I didn't know that Hampton. I knew the Hampton that was neighbors to me at Princeton, and he was 70 years old, and I'd go out there and help him cut hedge posts, and he'd still work me into the ground. You know, that's the Hampton I knew. I'd never seen him when he was in the bars or any of that stuff. Well, see, I worked with him. We all stayed at the same apartment complex when we all worked construction in Kansas City. Wow. (laughs) You had to be pretty rough and ready just to be in the same bar with Jim Hampton. Really? Yes. And did Hampton keep Jack from then on out, or Jake from then on out? Oh, yeah. And never sold him again? No. Couldn't buy him for nothing. Yeah. And Jake never had, they never bred a bunch of dogs to him or nothing either, did uh-huh. they? Lloyd bred the kit female, and she was out of the old original Hickory Nut Harry. Yeah. And looked just like Harry. She was a good dog. She didn't like deep water. Yeah. Which in this country ain't that ain't big a, a deal. deal. But, you know, she was a typical Harry dog, except that she wasn't rough. Old Hickernut Harry was rough. Yeah. You know, he looked like he had a little bulldog in him, and, I'm, and he acted like it, too. <laughs> but, you know, uh, those dogs were all patch dogs. They were bred to be patch dogs, yeah. you know, because, you know, the coons, when I was a kid, you, you'd drive across the creek bridge, and you'd look over there at the trees, and you shine your light across there. It'd look like Christmas, man. There'd be ice everywhere. Mm-hmm. You could drive from here to Princeton or here to Mercer, and you'd see four or five coons crossing the road, and you'd see four or five more that didn't make it. Yeah. You know? I mean, they were so thick, it was, you know. When, it, did, when did they thin out? Because they got thin mid-'80s, late-'80s. Yeah, distemper. Yeah. Yeah, they got real thin. Because when Missy was getting up, we didn't have that many coons whenever I was 15 or 16 years old. Not like it is now. We got plenty of coons now, too. Well... This is the most coons we've had since the 70s. Yeah. You know, the only problem is they're not worth nothing. When did uh, when did you start hunting with Grandpa Chuck? Mm. I don't know. It was before. Me and Randy went to work together for M. Sumner's doing cable in 1979 in Princeton. And I think I maybe hunted with Chuck a little bit before that. But from 1979 for sure to 19, 
probably 86 we yeah. hunted all the time i remember because i was on that other podcast and uh i tried to tell a story about al evans and old bear when grandpa killed bear and uh you may remember that better than i did but uh i said he was a red bone jeremy said he was a plot and what was he actually old bear? he was an english english dog pretty good dog did you hunt with him he was an unreal yeah he was just a young dog too right yeah he was unbelievable huh. he never missed really ever how old was he when grandpa killed him probably four yeah i didn't know i didn't think he was a very old dog i thought he was like two but al evans started that dog in the snow out in the field mousing you told me that. I think you told me this story. Tell that to the listeners. I want to hear that. Well, you know, people. a lot of people don't realize, but, you know, you, you get like a CRP ground. Mm-hmm. When snow gets on, that field's full of mice. They're just running around under the snow. And if you, uh, you know, if you're out in the early morning and you go running around out the country and you'll see a coyote or a fox out in the middle of a barren field and you wonder what the hell they're doing, they're mousing. And if you get back and watch them where you don't spook them, they'll sit there and they'll cock their head. Mm-hmm. And they'll hear that mouse. They'll jump up in the air and they'll come straight down and they'll get that mouse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen that. So that's how you train, that's how you train bear. Took bear liked to kill anything. He didn't give a shit what it was. <laughs> if it wasn't human, he was up for killing it. You know? Rabbits, squirrels, yeah. chickens. He didn't give a shit. <laughs> he wanted to kill something. So, you know, he'd get to chasing them mice around, and he'd catch him a mouse, you know, and he'd go it right down. Old Al just pet him, tell him he's a good dog. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, this is the only time I ever heard anybody starting a damn <laughs> dog mouse, you know. This is what Al told me. Yeah. Al, now... Al, let's get this straight, too. There ain't no more honest human being on this planet probably than Al Evans. Al didn't tell any tall tales. Or, no, he, he never no, exaggerated nothing. He wasn't no bullshitter. I mean, no. Al, Al was a pretty straight guy. Yeah, and if you didn't want to hear the truth, don't ask him. Yeah. Because he didn't care. He could, you know, you could be his brother, his mother. If you asked his opinion, you got it. Yeah. If it made you mad, that's your fault. Yeah. You know, but uh, then he started running him on rabbits. <laughs> And he rabbit hunting for the rest of that winter, you know. Shoot the rabbits for him, you yeah. know, just rabbit hunting him. Got to be a pretty fair rabbit dog. <laughs> and then he went to squirrel hunting him. Shooting squirrels to him. Got to be about a half. I mean, hounds are never as good as curs because no. they don't look, they don't hear. Yeah. They just nose only, you know. Yeah. They lose a lot of squirrels. But, uh, yeah, he started, and then he got him on coons and... But he was just a naturally gifted dog with a whole lot of desire. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and he was a freak. Yeah. Because I've seen seven or eight dogs out of that same bloodline, and there wasn't one of them worth a damn. You get those, too. We was talking about my old blue tick earlier, and he was like that. And I don't know. I never hunted with any of his parents. But when I sold that dog in 2001 or two, I sold him for three grand, which was a lot of money in 2002 for a dog, too. And he was a three-year-old. And his papers had dogs that weren't even purple ribbon bred, and he wasn't even registered in PKC. They had the single registry. I mean, he had, I don't know where, and they may have been good dogs. I don't know where this dog come from or nothing. Jimmy Smith had him, but he had him and Uno at the same time. Yeah, and she Uno, was for real. Yeah, Uno was a good dog. Uno was legit, too. Well, so was Smoke. So Jimmy sold Smoke to Kalen Miller. I ended up with him, you know, because I was hunting him for Kalen, and I ended up buying him off of him. But he was like that. He was just, I mean, here's a dog that's come out of nothing, and he's a one-bark tree dog that could drive a track and had motor for days, a blue tick that could just go hunting all night long, every night, tree 10, 12, 13 coons, and was real pretty about it and stuff. And they just didn't make those, especially in blue ticks back then. No. And so you get freaks, just absolute freak of nature. And that's what Grandpa apparently shot whenever he shot bear. <laughs> Yeah, because I seen I seen that dummy dog, which was closely related to Bear, 
go in a pond chasing a coon, and pretty soon the coon was chasing him. <laughs> that bear wouldn't have done that. No, bear would have grabbed the damn thing, and one <laughs> of them would have died. <laughs> So when you started up with Grandpa Chuck, what was he hunting? What did he have for dogs? Oh, dummy. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't know that was Grandpa Chuck's dog. Was dummy. Yeah. Yeah, he had dummy. And uh, I had Jack. Yeah. I mean, later. What did I have when we started hunting? Well, did you have Babe? I bought Babe. Chuck had babes. Chuck had babes then. Grandpa Chuck had babes. Dick Franklin. Oh, there's another one I forgot. Raised a litter of pups. Yeah, Dick was a good dog man, too. Oh, he had some awesome dogs. Yeah. That Oklahoma driver that he had was probably yeah. one of the top five dogs I've ever been hunting with, and I've been hunting with some good dogs. I got to take uh, Dick's daughter, Becca, and her husband, Nate, have asked me to take their boys hunting because Dick's gone now, you know, and they haven't been before, and I need to do that. Them's good boys, too, and that's, that's such a good family, too, and I always enjoyed being around Dick. Man, he was funny. He was Oh, something. yeah, I, I spent a lot of time in Kansas yeah. City with Dick. I and an wow. athlete. Oh, yeah. And an athlete, too. When he started growling, you better get your feet on the ground because the fight <laughs> done started. Nobody knew it yet. <laughs> so Grandpa was hunting babes. What were you hunting? Can't remember. I think I was hunting a dog that I bought off Bud Roberts. And Bud Roberts had Bennett Springs Bandits, which is a full brother to Finley River Banjo. Yeah. Bandit uh, took fourth place in the 78 UKC World Hunt. And he was a coon dog. I was hunting a double Sebastian bred blue tick bitch that I bought off Bud Roberts. Bud would not let Bandit touch a coon. But he went hide hunting, but he hunted dogs with him. Yeah. You know, and he would keep Bandit tied because he didn't want him scarred up or something. But this blue female was better than Bandit. Really? And the Sebastian family... Is still up there, still breeding the same line of dogs. Where at? Wisconsin. Really? Because I called them a year or two ago and asked them if they still had that line of dogs. They said, oh, yeah. Really? That's cool. And this dog, she was like smoke. Yeah. If she, if you was blind, you'd swear it was a walker dog. Yeah. Because she'd get through the country, drift a track, slam a tree, have a coon. I sold her when she was nine years old. She got hung in a fence, lost a back leg. She's a nine-year-old blue tick female, and I sold her for $600 in the 70s. That's pretty good money for a three-legged nine-year-old blue tick female. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Even today, I wouldn't give $600 for very many three-legged blue tick females. Sean Wood's got a pretty good one. Got three <laughs> legs. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. This thing was for real. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I, I always like blue ticks. I'm a glutton for punishment. Yeah. I've had some decent ones. I've had a few really good ones. But I've had a couple of hundred that wasn't worth a twenty-two yeah. bullet. Yeah. You know, and not that they couldn't tree a coon, but you didn't hunt them in cold weather because you'd freeze to death waiting for them to do it. <laughs> you know. It's just slow. No, they. Just, that was one thing I loved about Smoke is he was so laser quick about everything. I think a lot of Smoke's deal was. That he was gamey, and he loved to run trash when I first got him. That's the reason I got him, is Kayla Miller called me. And I was, I, was hunt, I was hunting for Tom Cooney at the time and Pete Swihart, and I was just hunting. That's all I was doing for a living. I was 19, 20 years old or something like that. And uh, Kaylin had this blue tick, and he said, Hey, you know, this thing runs deer, runs coyotes. Will you break him for me? I said, Yeah, I'll break him. I said, Bring him over. He goes, How much you charge? I said, I'll, I'll hunt him for a month. I'll charge you 300 bucks. All right. So I go take this dog, and I turn this joker loose by himself, and I'm thinking I'm going to have to walk this dog over some kind of off-game track and shock him on it, and I'll be done with it. Done deal. This sucker leaves like he's late for work. Gets <laughs> struck in there about six tenths, and I mean is just scalding whatever he's running. Now, I didn't have a shocking collar uh, on him. You know, I was just going to – it was a blue tick. I was just going to run him down and switch him and be done. 
I was four hours trying to catch this joker seven miles from where I turned him loose running this deer. And I mean just flying. And so I get him finally. I turned him loose about 8 o'clock at night. And I finally get him caught about midnight. And I just grabbed him and, and you know, gave him a little bit of a whipping, nothing crazy, and sent him out of there. And he went over there and got struck and treated coon. And I mean treated good. I thought, holy crap. What is this thing, you know? This is and a so, gold mine. Yeah, like two, two weeks later, I got him running this junk, and he ain't running it very far, and he's falling off on the first coon track he comes to. And three weeks later, he's looking for a coon when I cut him loose. And so I called Caitlin and said, hey, this dog's done. And I said, this is a really good coon dog. He said, well, I ain't got the money right now. How about you just take half of him? You can have half of him. I said, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> done deal. I hunted that dog up for another year and won some hunts with him and trained a lot of Tom Cooney's pups and a lot of Pete Swihart's pups with him. And then me and Kalen sold him for three grand and split the money. And I, I wish I had that dog right now because who knows what that dog would be worth. That's the second best blue tick I've ever seen go bar none. And the other one was Big Country. Big Country's legit, but so was Smoke. That Smoke was a good coon dog. But, but like, you know, you, like you said, they just didn't make them like that very often. Well, the thing is, see, back then, the entire mindset of 90% of the coon hunting community was catch hides. Yeah. Well, dogs that blew through the country, wide open, miss coons. Mm-hmm. Well, that was like a glaring no-no. Yeah. You know, nobody wanted dogs that miss coons because they're worth 35, 40 bucks a piece. You want to, don't, you know, they wanted vacuum sweepers. Yeah. And uh, it started to change, even in the early 70s, it started to change because a whole bunch of people in Iowa, land was high, taxes were high, they sold their farms down there, they come down here and they bought these farms and they wasn't thinking... You know, that dirt up there is three foot deep black dirt. You can grow 300 bushel corn on it. Down here, white oak clay on top of a hill, you're growing 80 acre. And mm -hmm. that's if you really fertilize it, you know. So they come down here, they dozed everything off, and they planted crops. Well, all of a sudden, there's more feed. And the next thing you know, in a couple of years, there's more coons. You know, you had to kick them out of the way to get to the truck. Yeah. You know, and, and hides were high. You know, and and... Bud Roberts had Bennett Springs Bandit, who was a really, really, really good coon dog. He was as good as Finley River Banjo. Yeah. Uh, he was as good as Rock River Stoney, who, you know, was uh, brother to brother and nephew. He was, he was right close related to Rock River Ring. I mean, but uh, his best coon dog was a seven-year-old one-eyed border collie. Really? For catching coons. Mm hmm and he'd tell you that, you know, you know, old, uh, Rob, if, if a, if a good hound guy, and I mean, I'm, Bud Roberts ain't here to defend himself, but the truth is always the truth. Um, you know, Bud had a, had a book bigger than a dictionary full of dog papers. He'd go to Rutledge and he'd buy good looking females. He'd breed them to bandit, advertise the pups in the, in a full cry, mm -hmm. you know, and the females didn't even know what a coon looked like, yeah. you know, but they was pretty. Well, that's where, that's where Bandit's reputation got hurt because he bred him to junk. Well, you can't breed a good dog to junk. Nope. Now, if you bred him to a good female, he'd throw good dogs. Yeah. Dean Francis had one named Joe. Me and Leroy Brown went hunting with him one night. Old Dean, you know, he's about oh, hard. I forgot about Leroy. That was another old hound hunter. I forgot about Leroy. And he uh, he wanted to see what the, if this dog was a coon dog. And there's about eight inches of snow on the ground. It's cold, January, rough. I looked around, you know, and hell, it took him an hour to get. The only reason I decided to go was because Dean's daughters, Wilma, was teaching them all how to bake. And I knew there was a <laughs> kitchen full of goodies. <laughs> So I told Leroy, I said, if we're going tonight, we got to meet at Dean's house because I'm getting me some cookies and shit or I ain't going. <laughs> well, about 30 minutes when they got me clubbed out of the kitchen, we went and turned that dog loose. We treed seven coons. I mean, just yeah. right down the line, you know, and, and old Dean looked around. He goes, well... 
That may be the best $500 I ever spent. I say, I'll give you your money back right now. Yeah. He goes, no. I said, how about if I double your money? And he wouldn't do it. And he hunted that dog through, and he was a, he was a good son of a gun and beautiful dog. He didn't look nothing like Bandit. Yeah. He was a little tight made, blanket back, yellow headed dog, high tenor ball. He didn't have a real loud mouth, but it had a cutting quality Carry to it. You could, you could hear him. Yeah. About like Missy. Yeah. Yeah. You could hear Missy forever. And she had oh, that yeah. old soft mouth and she'd be in there. You'd take off walking before Garmin's think she was <laughs> two or three hundred yards. And a mile later, she still sounds like she's two or three hundred yards. <laughs> You know, that old jack dog of mine, who Missy was out of. Yeah. He had a lot. He was one of the best reproducers in the damn country. Nobody knew it. I was too stupid to, you know. But here's a story on him. That dog was smarter than the average hound. Mm -hmm. When he was young, he was fully open on the ground. I didn't know that. He was a ball mouth track dog and a chop mouth tree dog. Really? Yes. Somebody gave Chuck Wilson, your granddad, gave him a little black and tan colored dog. And we looked her over and thought, well, it's got to be some kind of cur. One of the best, as far as a meat dog, as good a dog as I ever hunted with, and she was silent. Yeah. Jack was really competitive. He wanted to be the first dog to the tree. He could not beat her to a tree. It pissed him off. And he figured out that if he shut up, he could beat her to a tree. Yeah. He never opened on the ground after that day. Unless he was running a coon. Unless he was running junk. Yeah. But if he was running coon, he was silent. And he went to balling on the tree. Yeah. See, every time I remembered him, he was, if you heard Jack and he wasn't moving, he was treed and he had a coon. Yeah. That was all I knew about him. <laughs> but there's a lot. We hunt, we trapped all day. Yeah. And then we'd hunt till about 10 o'clock at night. And if we was, like if, if we was, a mile from the truck, and Jack was a mile the other way, we'd just go home, go to bed, and go get him the next morning and shoot his coon out to him, throw him in the truck. Really? He'd stay all night. Yeah. Had a lot. You know, I mean, he stayed all night a lot. Yeah. Because we'd just leave his ass, because we knew he'd still be treated in the morning, and he'd still have a coon. I've still got a picture of old Jack, but describe to the listeners what old Jack looked like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well... His coat of hair was really similar to a healer. Yeah. Maybe a little longer on the tail. Really short-eared, and I mean really short-eared. Long snipe nose. Two different colored eyes. About 35 pound. <laughs> I mean, he looked the yeah, ugliest coon dog that ever lived. Yeah, but you know, he never threw, he threw ticked up dogs. But they were all houndy looking. Yeah. They all had big heads, big ears, well built. Uh, I had one, remember that one I th he threw called Buck that was real pretty? Blanket back, red headed, and everybody was just about had a heart attack whenever he came out. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the only dog out of Jack that wasn't any good. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. Uh, Dwayne McDonald, I was hunting with Lloyd and Dwayne. I hunted with Lloyd a lot. Lloyd had come up here when he lived in South Missouri, and he'd go hunting with Dwayne. I always mm -hmm. tried to go with him, because Lloyd always had a coon dog. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, we was hunting one night, and we, the dogs was across the creek, and I mean, water was deep. It was cold. There wasn't nowhere to cross for half a mile either way. And I'm sitting here, and here's this six-month-old pup, and he's locked up treed. <clears throat> on this old holler snag. Well, Lloyd and Dwayne go to squall on that coon to look out that hole, but he wouldn't come out. Yeah. And they said, well, he's got him. Well, all the other dogs we called to us, we couldn't call him to us. Six months old, he's treed by himself. We go over here, tree another coon, shoot the coon, dogs are fighting the coon. He didn't even miss a bark. And I'm talking like maybe 100 yards away from him, you know. Six months old. He didn't care if you was there. He didn't care if God showed up. He's treed. He's treed. 
you do go in and snap a lead on him and drag him off. That's no. He was always like that. Yeah. So I had to swim the creek to get him. And Dwayne says, nope, you wait just a second. I'll be right there. He took his gun and everything off, and he swam over there, and he says, we're going to get this fucking coon if we have to <laughs> go home and get a chainsaw. You know? <laughs> okay. So we jacked around. We got the tree down. He got a hold of the coon. He fought like a maniac, you know. Dwayne looked at me. He says, if you sell that dog right there, because I'd had a lot of good young dogs I'd yeah. sold. Just, you know, lack of brains, whatever. He told me, he said, I will hunt you down and beat you half to death. He meant it, <laughs> you know. And years later, uh, your granddad didn't have a dog. Yeah. So I let him keep Jack for two or three years, you know. Yeah. And he hunted Jack, and I... That's how, that's why to this day that I still call you John W. Brooklyn. <laughs> because on Jack's papers, because back then we, we lost his easy entry card, and we'd have to take his whole papers in to put him in a hunt. And right there, it would said Brookman's Jack, and then it said below it, owner, John W. Brookman. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. I would never even know what your middle initial was if it wasn't for Jack. <laughs> so what was, what's the best dog you ever hunted with? The a best? Absolute best. You, if you had to have one dog as a one-year-old right now, you couldn't. You, you. This was your only choice. The only coon dog you're ever gonna have. What would? Which dog would you pick? And why? The best dog I ever hunted with. Yep. What's the one dog you wish you had in your hands right now? Probably Franklin's Oklahoma driver dog. That good. There ain't nothing this kind of... Maybe Venus could beat him, maybe. Yeah. But that dog was... He could treat any kind of coon, any kind of conditions. Never made a mistake. And never missed. Dick Franklin was offered a brand new pickup with 30,000 miles on it. Mine. And he laughed at me. <laughs> and I was pissed. But I couldn't whip him, so what am I going to do? Exactly. You know? But uh, I offered him my 79 Ford pickup. I got out of the truck, and I threw the keys at him, and he caught him. He says, what's this? I said, I'm going to trade for driver. He threw him back at me. He says, no, you ain't. Mm. He didn't even, you know, when the dog was like, hmm. I can't remember. He was nine or ten, and and he got injured. He fell off a bluff down on the river, and he screwed himself up some. And Dick had a good friend that hunted, and he didn't hunt hard. He just piddled, but he always had a good dog. And he come up there, and he had every Winchester lever action rifle that they ever made at that time and they were all pre-64 and i'm talking about some of them old rifles that they didn't make hadn't made for 60 80 years no. i mean and he brought that gun collection up there and he goes i want to trade for driver and franklin said nope he goes i'll trade for driver and i'll promise you he'll never leave my house i'll bury him on that place and he'll be the have the best of care and franklin went to looking at them guns and you know franklin traded guns he knew what guns oh, were yeah. worth yeah and uh, he looked that collection over, and he traded, and he let driver go. But I guarantee you, I'm not no gun expert, but I know what I've seen, and I'll bet you, even then, had to be thirty, forty thousand dollars worth of guns there. Because I mean, you're talking about a truckload of rifles, yeah. and. A lot of them were, you know, black powder, some of the first cartridge guns ever made. You know, they didn't even make ammo for them no more, you know. Yeah. I mean, and it was all pristine. You know, this guy was a real, I mean, he was a collector. But he just wanted to say he owned the best. He said, I just want to be able to say I own the best damn coon dog that ever drew breath. And he had access to, I mean, you know, he could have bought 
house was lippered for that. I mean, you know, yeah. he could have bought anything. And that's the dog he wanted to buy. Really? And he had a million-dollar mouth. I mean a million-dollar mouth. Clear, loud baritone. You could hear that dog in a hurricane. Hmm. And he wasn't a hard tree dog. He was like old Deuce. Yeah. But it was just steady, just ow, ow. And Deuce is one of the prettiest tree dogs I've ever hunted yeah. with. Well, that's the way Driver treed. Yeah. But Driver wasn't a real great-looking dog. Yeah. I mean, he looked like a coon dog, but he wasn't a real great-looking dog, you know. But uh, he sure was pretty when he was skinning those $40 coons. <laughs> Dick Franklin used to go to Minnesota in October, and he would do nothing but coon hunt all the way down through to Arkansas in February. Their season ended February 15th. Yeah. And from middle of October to the middle of February, Franklin wasn't around. He was coon hunting somewhere. Dick was a good man and a good mule man, too. Oh, yeah. And good he, mule skinner. He sold two of the best dogs he ever owned to your uncle. Which ones? Blaze and... Uh, what was that other dog's name? He was out of Kentucky. Chief, I think is what he called uh, him, which too. Which uncle? Billy. Billy, yeah. Blaze was out of the old rowdy dog. And Chief was out of Kentucky River Chief. Yeah. He bought them both. Franklin got them off Dick Abel. And uh, they were for real. They were serious business. You know? But that's, Billy, that's, that's more dog than Billy needed. Yeah, but Billy, <laughs> what happened was Billy was up there coon hunting with some of his buddies, mm -hmm. and they kept giving him a hard time about his quality of dog. Well, he'd been down here and hunted with Dick's dogs, yeah. you know, and and you know he says, "Where are you out packing the coons to the truck?" You know. I remember Billy. One of my earliest memories are Billy or coon hunting, and he would come down from Michigan, and back then. It ain't like it is today, John. It wasn't fun. You know, it was cold. When you're six or seven years old, it ain't that much fun. I mean, it was cold, miserable. You had one little flashlight. You didn't have any Gore-Tex clothes. You didn't have any chaps. You didn't have any nothing. No. And your parents and whoever was hunting with you didn't really care if you were comfortable or not. <laughs> they don't get caught. I didn't get coddled like my kids do. But Billy would stop. That was when Casey's had potato wedges and fried chicken. And we'd go hunting down by Princeton. And Billy would stop at Casey's all the time and buy me all the fried chicken and potato wedges I could eat and pop. And we were poor. We didn't get pop. And I remember that to this day. And they would let me stay in the truck with all that fried chicken and all them potato wedges and all that pop. And I never left the truck. They'd and there go, wasn't nothing left when they got back. Oh, no. I didn't at all. <laughs> I, was, I was so happy to have something like that. I loved it when Billy come down to go coon hunting. Heck, yeah, I'm going coon hunting with you. <laughs> Yeah. I don't care. I'll ride in the dog box for potato wedges <laughs> and chicken. All but, right. you know, Billy had money because he was a union yeah, operator. Yeah, yeah, Billy didn't. He he made good money. Yeah, yeah and, and he had money. And he come down here, and I don't remember what it was. He, he paid like. And he hit Franklin when I don't remember just what happened, but Franklin had a little problem, and he had to come up with some cash yeah. pretty quick. Probably... Needed some lawyer money because he beat three or four guys to death or something, you know. <laughs> but uh, he come down here at five grand and said, I want those two dogs. And Frank goes, I'll help you load them. Yeah. You know, and the next day I'm at Franklin's, okay. Well, he wasn't hurting as bad as he because, you know, Jim Holt was his brother-in-law and he had uh, a female out of Rock River Ring called Queenie. Jim, and, or Dick always had a knack for coming up with another good dog. Yeah. You know, he, oh, he was going to find him another good dog. Well, he had one because you couldn't get Queenie if you, you couldn't buy Queenie uh, for the Half Rock Cattle Company. I mean, you, you couldn't do it. Jim wasn't a big time hunter and Jim, you know, mm -hmm. Jim worked, Jim had money. He, his family was doing fine. He, that dog's just fine where she's at. He didn't give a shit. And she was as good as you're going to find. Yeah. You know. And uh, so he had her. And I think that's when he found the driver dog. When he sold them dogs to Billy, he went and bought the driver dog. Yeah. That's the best dog you've hunted with. It's as good as any dog I ever yeah. hunted with. I'm, 
you know, I'm an old man, and I've had a lot of head trauma. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I could be forgetting something, but I'll tell you something. That, that uh, what was her name? An old blue tick Walker Cross dog that Kenny had when he was a kid. Got her off. Bucky Kaufman started her. Yeah. Mandy. See, back then when we was kids, and we wasn't even driving yet. We'd drive to Livonia to go to the hunt, but we didn't have a license. You know, uh, they had grade hunts. Yep, yep. She won 10 hunts in a row. I'm talking about 50, 60 dogs in the hunt. I say that was, back then there were more grade dogs than there was registered dogs. Oh, yes. Yeah. And you're talking about, you're talking about people that hunted, seriously hunted, to support their families. Yeah. So there wasn't none of this junk dog show up at these hunts. These some bitches go tree coon. Yeah. And, and, and the way you, I don't know how they do UKC now, but back then there was no tournament, nothing. The highest score won the hunt. Yep. So you're hunting against 60 dogs. Yep. And she won 10 in a row. First place, that's 10 first do. places in a row. Yeah. That's hard to do. Now I'll tell you something. She has to be, without a doubt, the most aggravating dog I ever hunted in my life. How so? Okay, you go out there, you got a spot picked. You know, there's a, there's a four foot wide, two foot deep trail where the coons run every night. You see five of them in a tree right there, you cut her that direction. That don't mean nothing to her. <laughs> she thought she knew better than you. She did know better than us. <laughs> she did. You could turn her loose in the Sahara Desert. She'd tree five coons before yeah. you'd get your ass hydrated enough to get out of the truck, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, there wasn't no handle on her. You caught her at a tree. Yeah. She didn't know nothing about come here, come back, don't do this, don't nothing. Turn her loose. When she trees, go shoot the coon. She, she was as good a coon dog as I. As far as catching coons, yeah. she was an aggravating son of a gun. But she didn't have the bells and whistles and stuff like Driver no. had. No bells and whistles. Yep. And another thing she'd do, you couldn't hunt young dogs with her. She would go right over there, get them young dogs, go over there, get a deer started hot, get them dogs to run a deer. Then she'd go over here and start treeing coons. Yeah. Didn't you know want, what I mean? Didn't want them young dogs following She around. didn't want nobody with her, just her. She didn't even want older dogs with her. Yeah. It just, they wouldn't pay no attention to her when she tried to get them. I've seen her with older dogs go out and start a deer, and they go over here and tree coon. Well, that'd piss her off. Then she could... Forget the deer and go over here and tree coons. Yeah. But she tried to get him to run the deer. She just didn't like dogs around yeah. there. But she probably put more coon on the board or as many as any dog I've ever been with. And that you was Francis's dog? Yeah. He got it. Bucky Kaufman started her. When I was... Francis sold me my first coon dog. A little Candy. Yeah. And she was a... He didn't live where Anthony lives now. He lived over there by the Baptist Church, I think, if I remember right. Did he live over there at one time? Yep. I think that's where he was. Maybe he was at Anthony's then. I can't remember what year little Candy was born. But I remember Grandpa Chuck telling me I could have this dog. And Kenny had a litter of pups on the ground, and it was out of Old Candy and I think Finley River Boone, yep. if I remember right. Yep. And Grandpa Chuck gave him $100 and a twenty two rifle. For this pup and we brought her home and she went to run and tree him pretty quick and i put her in a hunt when i was 10 or 11 or something like that and she caught a coyote on the ground and killed it by herself and i thought i thought that was bad and looking back now any she i think she was only like eight months old yeah any pup now that'd run out there at eight months old and run a coyote down and kill it i'd have been pretty impressed i'd have just tried to get that thing's mind on coons you know but we kind of had ruined her and got her chewed up in a couple of hunts, and Kenny bought her back and kept her for a long time. But Kenny Francis was the guy that I bought my first coon dog that only I owned. Now, that being said, even though I'm the only owner, Grandpa Chuck still sold her for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I showed up one time, and she wasn't there anymore, and all of a sudden she wasn't my dog anymore. She was Grandpa Chuck's dog. <laughs> we had young Candy you was talking about. Yeah. Right down here south of town where that... Road goes by the old woman's place at Road Cuts, and we was right back west there in that draw. Yeah. And Missy was treating the brush pile, trying to, and you could hear her fighting it. Yeah. Well, when we got up there close, you could hear this pup, and she's down in the brush pile too. So I get elected to crawl down in this brush pile and get these <laughs> dogs out, okay? So I got the little, I got little candy out 
you know, I'm crawling down there to get Missy. And here comes two coons. So I just ducked my head. They run right up over my back. I was there. I was there. I remember that. <laughs> you had you had a white t-shirt on. Yeah. You had coon tracks and dog tracks both <laughs> on your white t-shirt. Yeah. I remember that. Because Missy was right behind them. Yep. And Chuck was laughing so hard he couldn't even catch her. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think me and you and Jeremy and Grip and Chuck were all on that hunt. Yeah. Down south of town. What, Muddy Creek Bridge, wasn't we? No, it was right down here was we? and right west there yeah, yeah. where Bruce Higgins's and yep. Goodens come together yep. down that fence row in that big draw. Hunter Bridge, they called it. Yeah. Hunter Bridge, yeah. That's what I was thinking of. I remember that. Johnny, what else? You got to, just one good, give me one good Grandpa Chuck story and we'll call her a night. I'll give you one good Grandpa Chuck story. All right. I don't know what bridge it is. It's where Leroy Brown used to live. Yeah. That bottom there on the west side of the creek. I think I know what you're talking about. Down along the bluff, down at the bottom end of that, you know, about a half mile down there. Kenny and whoever Kenny's hunting with was treed. Me and Chuck's driving through there, getting ready to drop again. We could hear the dogs and we could hear the gunshots. So we just stopped in the middle of the road, rolled the window down, waiting for it to get over with, you know. And they shoot, and they shoot. And they shoot, and they shoot some more. And pretty soon they don't shoot. Pretty soon here comes somebody with a light. Well, you can, there's somebody back there still shining a tree, but somebody's walking to the road. And Chuck goes, <laughs> they ran out of bullets. <laughs> they did. <laughs> Must have shot two boxes. Yeah. Never hit the coon. Now, you got to understand, your grandpa couldn't see nothing. He could shoot, though. Now, I went hunting with him. Deer hunting, he run right into the barbed wire fence. I had to tighten the wire back up. He's about like a tank, you know. <laughs> and he couldn't see that fence. But there was a patch of snow across the creek and the heavy timber, a little patch of snow in the timber. And when that nine-point buck crossed that snow, he shot him one shot and killed him dead. And that's like it was coon hunting. He couldn't see nothing. You had to about half guide him down through there. Mm -hmm. But when he'd shine that light up in that tree and that coon look at it, one shot of that pistol... That coon was dead, okay? So these guys shoot two boxes of shell. These are young men, perfect vision. Chuck goes down there, shoots a coon with a pistol one time, comes back to the truck. He's ready to go. Coon's dead, you know. And them guys was mad for a month. <laughs> they got a rifle, and he's got that damn old pistol, and they can't hit that coon two boxes of shells. He goes down there, plink. Done. What about that coon that you quick drew? Oh, we was down there at the <laughs> Creek Bridge where I used to own, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, we decided to go and turn loose, send them south on the creek. Man, they bailed off the road, bailed right down in the creek, and was baying right under the bridge. Chuck goes, well, that didn't take long. Well, we knew Everett trapped that creek bridge. Well, we got down there, and there's a coon big enough to pack me and you both off, you know? <laughs> and he's got his two middle toes caught in this trap, just barely caught in this trap. Well, Jack, they're baying. I said, well, we're going to have to do something quick because that sucker's a fix to pull loose and kill us all, you know? <laughs> well, I'm walking up there to get a hold of the dogs, and I'm about three foot away, and this coon reaches down with one paw and grabs that trap and rips the other one out, looks right at me and jumps. Here he comes. Airborne. <laughs> at my head. You know? <laughs> so I just quick dream and shot him, kill him dead as hell. <laughs> Chuck told me that story a hundred times, I think. The Brookman quick draw. <laughs> uh, I remember when Grandpa... Chuck says, Chuck says, man... He said, it's a good thing he was born a lot later than Bill Hickok. No one ever knew his name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, grandpa had that pistol. I remember when I was 16, and Grandpa was, wasn't getting around very good then. And I was hunting with Phil Stark a lot and all my cousins and stuff, you know. And Grandpa wanted to go one night. And I had, I, I had we still hunt Missy. And Grandpa was still hunting some, but not very much. And when you're 16, you always, when you're a young kid, you always want to be the one that shoots the coon. 
And he'd always tell me, he said, hey, hold that light, you know, on the coon, and I'll shoot right in the middle of your light. And he'd hit them every time. Oh, but yeah. I got to where I wanted to shoot the coon, so I'd hold that light just a little bit to the left or to the right. I'd say, there he is, Grips, go ahead and shoot in the middle of the light. Man, he'd just paint. He'd tear every limb off in the middle of that light beam for six or eight or ten rounds, you know, and he'd go, I can hit that thing. Here you go. And I'd get to shoot the coon. <laughs> he never once knew I was holding that coon, that light off that coon. <laughs> He could shoot that pistol. Oh, he could shoot. He yeah, you didn't shoot. want to get in a gunfight with that blind guy. No, and ask. Well, of course, ask Al Evans. He shot that. He shot. That's how he shot Bear. Is he'd see. He'd see eyeballs. Well, you know how that happened, don't you? Uh. Uh-uh. They was coming across the bottom, and there was a little bluff, just about thirty foot high. Yeah. Well, the coon they was treed on was a tree at the base of that bluff, and it ran. Just a little old snag. Well, Bear's coming down that bluff. And he's coming right beside that tree. So when Chuck looked, oh, it, it looked, looked like, like a coon coming like down the coon tree. Coming down the tree. So Chuck just bam. And kill Bear. And kill Bear. Heck of a shot though. Oh yeah. Consider it's about 35, 40 yards away. <laughs> Johnny, you got anything else for us? I'm gonna have to get you on here again. This was fun. <laughs> Oh, I had a lot of fun. And, you know, uh, back when I was a kid, there were a lot of old houses around. Yeah. You know, Eddie Robinson owned a lot of ground, and he yeah. and he had a lot of old houses. He had a dog out of Finley River Dan, old Dan. And she was a full sister to Finley River Jeff, who was probably one of the best reproducing Finley River dogs of all time, but he got killed when he was about two years old on the highway. But uh, her name was Jenny. She was a coon dog. Real live coon dog. Yeah. Wasn't no bigger than a minute. Weighed about 30 pounds. She didn't know that. So she trees in this old house. Well, Eddie owns a house. Hides her 35, 40 bucks. He says, we're going to get these coon, this coon. You know? And Jenny would go along the walls, and she would tell you where that coon was, and you could rip a hole in the wall, and there's the coon. Yeah. Well, she's going from over here to this wall to over here on the floor and over to that wall and down over here. And she's got about four spots right there. And she goes, wow, this ought to be fun. <laughs> Marty Neighbors, Kenny Francis, Eddie Robinson, and me. So we all pick a spot. We're starting to tear the wall out. Well, what we forgot was we only got three dogs. There's four coons, okay? <laughs> Marty was up on the windowsill. Kenny was on the wood stove. <laughs> And I was kicking coons, and I mean, you know, these things were whipping a dog and coming after us, and it was like, you know. Yeah, it was a circus. Eddie got his arm chewed half to pieces. He killed one with a pocket knife while I was chewing his arm half off, you know. And I got lucky. I tripped, and I landed both knees on the coon, and it killed him stone dead. <laughs> you know, I landed on his rib cage, and he said, hell, I'll just die. It's easier, you know. <laughs> and Marty's on the windowsill, and every time that coon make a jump for him, you know, he'd boot him in the head, you know. Yeah. And the dogs, you know, as soon as they grab a coon, well, hell, them, them coons were big. You know, they like 20-pounders, and they just quit them dogs, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. I mean. That just goes to show you, Johnny. Is everybody hears this podcast, they hear me interviewing Jed Finley's and Michael Ward's and John Strickland's, and they see Jeremy, you know, with all the success that he's had with Venus and the dogs he's got coming up and stuff and the entries he's paying, and they think, oh, they're just money men that do this and do that. There ain't no more humbler beginnings than what we had. <laughs> no. <laughs> and Jeremy, you know, he'd be three or four riding in a truck with me yep. and Grandpa Chuck, and, and you know, I mean, he's a little kid, so about 2 or 3 in the morning, he'd crash out. So when the dog's treed, one of us went to the dog, one of us stayed with Jeremy. If you didn't wake him up when the dog treed, he was mad. Yep. And he'd stay mad for days. I wasn't mad, though, was I? No, you didn't bother me. <laughs> Hell no, as long as the heater worked, there was a snack, he was good to go, <laughs> yeah. you know? I wasn't no dummy. I, you no. go get them dogs. I'll sit here with these potato wedges. Well, that's why I loved old Jack, because if I didn't feel like getting out and getting froze, hell, no problem. He'll be there yep. tomorrow morning when I can see yep. what I'm doing. You know? I mean, but but I'll tell you what. I've had a lot of good dogs. I've had some good ones. Yeah. 
I own Supergirl, you know. Yeah. Supergirl was. She, she was like a fun. machine. Oh, she was the same dog. Every no matter time what. you turned her loose. And never made a mistake. Nope. And if something beat her, it's because they were just better at tree and coons than her that night. Because I don't care where you turned her loose or what you turned her loose in or what the weather was like. She was the exact same dog. Her whole life, her whole career, which yeah. is so rare. She yeah. made gold champion back when it was hard to make gold champion. And Dollar and, made gold champion back when it was hard to make gold champion, you know. But, you know, I'm talking... And, and the thing was nice about girl like Dijon, you know, when he was little. Yep. And we're not going to mention no names, but Dijon knew several people that was really good to him, and he loved the hell out of them. Yeah. But when Dijon Brookman walks about five times to a dog in a row, and there's no coon, he's pretty much done with yeah, that. Yeah, he's, he's had enough. <laughs> he, we ain't going with that no more. Yeah. You know. Well, he'd always tell me, he'd say, "Well, I'll go, but you got to go get one of Jeremy's dogs." Yeah. Because Jeremy's hardcore. I mean, if it. It don't take very many screw ups, and you know, yep. there's a different dog. You know, I mean, he he don't put up with much stupidity. Yeah. And and Dijon liked that because he says I don't mind walking a half mile to the tree. He says I don't even have to shoot the coon, but I want to see the coon. Yep. You know, he said if I walk across that muddy field, I want it to be for a reason. You know. I remember Duds was a young dog. And I took him to an RQE or something like that up at LeGrand and won it or something. And someone put on, I think it was UKC forums or something, one of them internet pages or something. And they said, uh, when the Michaelis boys show up to a hunt, they're packing a good dog. And there is not a bigger compliment on this planet than that. Now, sometimes I don't think I'm packing, you know, yeah. They're not very good dogs to me, you know, <laughs> but everyone says, oh, when they when they show up at a hunt, they're packing a good dog. And Jeremy's always packed a good dog. Oh, yeah. Other than style. I wasn't a big fan of style. Now, Jeremy made that dog pretty good. Yeah, and but I want to tell you I was there for a lot of that. Yeah. That, I'll tell you what, I'd rather, I'd rather be a hod carrier. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a big fan of style. We took him to the vet. Up there when old Harmon was still the vet. Yeah, yeah. And you know, Harmon, in Corden, Iowa, Harmon's seen a lot of hounds. Harmon was a good vet. We pulled that dog in there, and he took one look at that, and he said, that is a magnificent son of a bitch. He oh, said, wasn't he pretty, though? That's oh, as good man, a looking dog pretty. as ever lived. Yeah. And, and old Jeremy looked right at Harmon, he goes, well, that's as far as it goes right there. <laughs> <laughs> but to Jeremy's credit... Manny hunted that dog and got him right to where he could win in tree coons, and that was hard to do. Oh, boy. There ain't very many human beings on this planet that could have made that dog as good as he was. No. Because that was a sorry ass. I, I'll but say Jeremy, that, that is, a sorry ass Jeremy is blessed with a gift that most people don't have. He can see the truth about a dog with no emotional attachment. Mm -hmm. or He can see the blank truth you know, and you got to if you're going to have good dogs. Yes, you have you got to. to know what they yes. are. Yes, but you know, there's no emotional attachment. There's no, you know, I've had the dog seven years. Yeah. Blah blah blah. Well, now he, it, he'll know. get attached to them, but it's because they're good coon dogs. They got to be awfully damn good. He's if pretty he attached to Venus. Well, but yeah, he, well, he would sell her. He would sell. I mean, he's attached to her, but he would sell. Her. I don't think he would now. Ah, you never know. I don't know. And he was attached to Suds. Yes. Very attached to Suds. Deuce, he hated Deuce. Him and Deuce were like me and Duds. They're, they're going to live till they're 15 years old just to aggravate us to death. But uh, Suds he was attached what. to. He loved old Suds. I'll tell you what. And I hunted Suds a lot. And I hunted Deuce a lot. Mm -hmm. My son loved Deuce. Mainly because he got excited that one time down there on Black Lake. And he pulled me off my feet. And I landed in about 12 <laughs> inches of mud. <laughs> And and I you thought, want to talk about bells and whistles? Deuce had bells and whistles. Yes. That dog was as pretty and fun to listen to as any dog on the planet. And if you were hunting at home, he yep. was almost unbeatable. Just like Duds, him and Duds were. A he lot just alike. didn't want to haul. Yep, him and Duds were a lot alike. But if you hunted him at home, buddy, he yep. was tough to clean yep. after, unless she was in standing beans. Yeah, he hate, he'd waller in them bean fields like an idiot. Bella would, too. I've never seen a dog hang up in beans like that. Uh, Bella did. Duds and Bella both. Only two I've seen that do it bad. 
Uh, that Mays would, that one of Rawson's would too. Oh, would he? Yeah. Well, yeah, but he's out of deuce. Yeah, he's out of deuce. There you go. Yeah. Bella just come by it. But I'll tell you what, deuce. when a frost hit the ground and you wanted to go catch coons, you go find yeah. me one without do deuce. When deuce come tree and you sitting there listening to him, just yeah, 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 yeah. And, there, and he could be like that. The same pace, the same rhythm, the same everything for hours. It was beautiful to listen to. Oh, yeah. I remember the first time I heard him tree, because me and Jeremy don't hunt together very much. We will on occasion. Once a year, twice a year, we'll go hunt together. And I was hunting with him and Croson one night, and we turned Deuce loose, and I think he treated a slick. It was the first time I'd hunted with him. He's three or four. And he got struck, and he got trailed up, and he come treed, and I thought, that's that's like a Picasso. Yeah, I mean that is the most one of the most beautiful things on God's green earth was when that dog come tree, and he was good about having coons. He didn't tree very many slits. Oh no, he was good about yeah, having coons. He was a good. He was a good coon dog. I remember when Jeremiah Howe was going to hunt him at the Governor's Cup, and he looked like crap all week. And, and uh, Jeremiah called Jeremy and said, "Hey, this dog at Jeremy said, I'll just take him. He'll be fine." He goes, "Jeremy, this dog hasn't treated a coon in a week." He goes, "Oh, no, just take him. He'll be fine." So Jeremiah didn't pay his. Uh, Iowa deal or Tree and Walker fanciers deal up or nothing like that, and the dog went out and scored like nine seventy five and won the whole hunt. And treated like five coons by himself. <laughs> 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 he was just like that, you know. You never knew about him, but man, that dog when he come treated was something to behold. Oh yeah, Johnny, you got anything else for us? Oh, maybe another time. We're gonna do it another time. This was fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. All right, John, uh, thanks for just upholding. Because, I mean, most people wouldn't know about these dogs or any of this stuff. Because, I mean, Ravana was a hotbed of good coon hunters. Oh, yeah. I mean, an absolute hotbed. And Mercer County, Missouri was a hotbed of good coon hunters. And maybe it's like that everywhere else, but this is just what I know. Yeah. That's where I was raised. So maybe there was places like this. Everywhere, and there's still places like that now. But right now, me and Ed Poe, I think, are the only two people with dogs in Ravana. Probably. And so, I mean, it's 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 falling. We're gonna have to get some coon hunters recruited in here. Well, I'm old and crippled. I can't I can't <laughs> ram through the brush like I did. <laughs> we'll get them again one of these days. I can lend moral support. There you go. That's drink all we whiskey. Need. <laughs> John, thanks for joining us. It's been a blast. Uh, I just want people to. We interview all these uh, these big names, and there were big names back in the 70s and 80s that people had never heard of, but they were big names locally because we didn't have Facebook. We didn't have the no. Internet. We didn't have all that stuff. There's a lot of good dogs that nobody's heard of. Oh, yeah. I mean, a bunch. So I'm glad Kenny you got... Fr- Kenny Francis, had, he used to buy dogs off of a guy mm-hmm. named Roberts, Wendell Roberts. He was a preacher down at Versailles. Yep. He had a dog called Dan. And he will tell you today, oh, he's just an average dog. No. Good dog. Uh, yeah. Hell of a dog. Ugly. He's uglier than Jack. Oof. The only difference was he was short-haired. Yeah. He had a curl tail. <laughs> he's real light in the back end. He had short ears. He had bird dog ears. He had pointy nose, pink nose. <laughs> but he didn't ever make a mistake either. Yeah. He never... Ever, I don't ever remember hearing him ever open on a cold track. You know, when he opened his mouth on a track, he was going to treat a coon. He had to have a track. I never seen him lay very many up. Yeah. But, me, but but he could treat a coon. He treated a lot of coons. Hell, we had we damn near got arrested when we was kids right here at the north edge of town because we took him. Kenny took him. He's six weeks old <laughs> or eight weeks old, little baby puppy. <laughs> We're hunting from town. We we just walked out yeah. in the pasture. You know. We're coming back, and we look around, the pup ain't with us. Well, Kenny freaks, you know, oh, shit, you know, I just paid 200 bucks for this pup, which was on way big money back then, you know. That was, like, big money. Oh, yeah. Of course, the dog was out of, like, Shady Lake Bali or something. I mean, he's a high-bred son of a gun, you know, uh, for back in them days, you know. He's as good a bred dog as you could buy. So we're out there with our lights looking around, just walking around, looking around, you know, in the tall grass to see where we could see this puppy curl up somewhere. You know, we figured he was curled up asleep. 
Somebody called the sheriff, and they come out and thought we were stealing Harry Weaver's cattle. <laughs> I said, Harry Weaver's my uncle. If I'm going to steal cattle, it sure as hell ain't going to be off Harry Weaver. <laughs> Harry Weaver chased you down and club you, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, he would, too. Did you find the pup? Yeah, after about an hour and a half. <laughs> Obi helped us look. Did that pup make anything? That was Dan. Oh, that was Dan. Yeah. Really? And he got another one he called Ben, but Ben wasn't nothing like Dan. Yeah. I mean, he'd run tree coon, but he wasn't up to Dan. Huh. That Dan dog was, he was a coon dog. Really? Yeah. Can Every he... other dog he got was pretty, yeah. had a good mouth. Dan, he squeaked and squacked and whatever on track. He had a good tree mouth. Yeah. Running mouth wasn't worth a damn. Kenny had some good dogs over the years. Old Drifter was a pretty good dog. Old Candy was a good dog. Little Old Candy, Candy was a good dog. Yeah. If he hadn't, he screwed her up. Yeah. But that dog was a hell of a dog. Yep. Yeah. And old, uh, that last female I had, old Hemi, was a good dog. That was a good coon dog. I, I, I assume he still got him. I think he does. Yeah. That was a, that, I always liked Hemi. I tried to buy her. I was five minutes late from buying that dog. Jordan Robbins had that dog. He had her. In a dog box and a Garmin and everything for sale for like twelve hundred bucks or something crazy, and she was a young dog then. And I heard about it from Ed, and I called down there and said, "Hey Jordan, I'm gonna come down there. I'm gonna buy Hemi. You know, I'll be down there in a little bit." And he goes, "Well, Kenny's Kenny's on his way already." Oh, golly, that's a good dog. And he was. still got her. I think he still got her. I that's guarantee he dog. still got her because I oh. asked, I called him the other day, and he said yeah. he still had her. That Annie's a good dog too. That one he's got off Bone Collector. That's a pretty good dog. Well, I guarantee you one thing. I'd bet $100 to a five spot that both of them put together can't tree as many coons as that old Mandy he had when he was a kid. No, probably not. And he'll probably tell you the same thing. Well, oh, speaking of good coon dogs, Mandy, that one Jeremy had. That one Tom Barrett took out there to West Virginia for a while. That was a good coon. That's the best dog I still think to this day that Jeremy ever owned. That was a good coon dog. All right, Johnny. We are at... We're over an hour. We did good. We're going to get you on here again. We'll get you on here with one of the circle points deal where we just talk about dogs with Jed one time. That'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you guys enjoyed listening to this. This is The Truth on the Houndsman XP Podcast Network, and we are, as always, happy to bring it to you. Man, what a great episode. Josh has just been bringing us such great content to the truth every week. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure you're sharing it with your friends, sharing it at the hunt you're headed to, and uh, telling your buddies about it too. If you haven't done so, leave us a review over on iTunes, over where you're getting your podcast from. Just a, a five-star review, <laughs> of course, and uh, just a line or two. I love the truth. I love Houndsman XP. Uh, you know, just, just lay it out there for us. It helps us in the ratings and it helps us with putting this show together. And that translates into sponsorship and keeping the lights on around here. And in closing, don't forget to check out Dogs Are Treat. This is premium gear made by houndsmen for houndsmen. And it's, it's a one-time purchase for you. You are going to lose this gear before you wear it out. So don't be intimidated at the price point. It is high quality, and it comes from great people. You can check out Dogs Are Treat on our website at houndsmanxp.com or go to their website, dogsartreat.com, and enter the promo code, all capital letters, HXP20% off. Again, that promo code is HXP20 with the symbol for percent off, all capital letters. Gives us a little walking around money, keeps us on the road, and um, gives Josh an opportunity to buy that cow drool beer, mad dog beer, mad cow beer, whatever that stuff is. But anyway, keeps us bringing you high-quality stuff like this. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you next week.